Many years ago, I realized how powerful it was to listen to a person. And in recent months, I have been working on a paper trying to take a fresh look at the at the power of listening, at the power of, of an empathic way of being. And that's what I want to talk to you about. We should re-examine and re-evaluate that very special way of being with another person, which we call empathic. I believe we tend to give too little importance and consideration to an element which is extremely important in the understanding of personality dynamics and for affecting changes in personality and in behavior. I think it's one of the most delicate and potent tools that we have, and I'm impressed at how rarely we see it in real-life situations in any full-fledged form. Um, I, I guess I'll start with my somewhat uh, faltering history in relation to this, uh, to this topic. Very early in my work as therapist, I discovered that simply listening to my client very attentively was an important way of being helpful. So when I was in doubt as to what I should do, in some active way, I simply listened. And it seemed surprising to me that such a passive kind of interaction could be so useful. And a little later, a social worker whom I hired who'd had a background of Ronkian training was really uh, most helpful to me. She helped me to learn that the most effective response, the most effective listening was where you listen for the feelings and emotions that were behind the words, that were... Um, just a little bit concealed, and um, where you could discern a pattern of feeling behind what was being said. And I think she's the one who uh, first suggested that uh, the best response to, was to reflect these feelings to the client. And reflect is a word that later made me cringe, but at the time it really was very helpful to me in my uh, in my work as a therapist, and I was I was very grateful to her. I felt I learned a great deal from her. She learned very little from me. Uh, then uh, came my transition to a full-time university position, where, with the help of students, I was finally able to scrounge the equipment for recording our interviews, a dream I'd had for a number of years. And I just can't exaggerate the excitement of our learnings as we clustered about the machine, which enabled us to listen to ourselves, playing over and over again some puzzling point in the interview uh, at which something clearly went wrong, or focusing on those moments in which there seemed to be um, a response that helped toward significant forward movement in the interview. I guess I, I still regard uh, listening to one's recorded interviews as perhaps the very best mode of improving oneself as a as a helping person. Um, among many lessons from listening to these recordings, we came to realize that listening to feelings and reflecting them was a complex, a, a vastly complex experience. Um, we discovered that we could pinpoint a therapist response where uh, significant forward movement occurred. We could, uh, where, where perhaps the client was talking in a uh, vague and desultory fashion, and one therapist response would enable him to really begin to move. And you could also pinpoint the responses where a nice forward moving process was brought to a dead stop by one. Uh, one particular response. So, in such a context of learning, it became quite natural that uh, we focused upon the content of the therapist's response rather than upon the empathic quality of the listening. I no longer particularly apologize for that. It probably was a necessary step in our, in our learning. 
to this extent, we became very much conscious of the techniques that the counselor or therapist was, was using. We became really expert in analyzing in minute detail. I can remember sitting around with students and, and picking apart sentences and particular phrases and words. Um, and we profited a great deal from that very microscopic study of the, of the interview process. I think we gained a great deal from it. Um, but this tendency to focus on the therapist's responses had consequences which appalled me. Uh, I was meeting considerable hostility as to my point of view, and that, that really didn't seem to bother me. But, uh, but this kind of thing did bother me, because the whole approach came in a few years to be known as a technique. Uh, non-directive therapy, it was said, is the technique of reflecting the client's feelings, period. So then you've taken care of non-directive therapy. Or even worse, uh, well, an even worse caricature was simply that uh, in non-directive therapy, you just say the last, say back the last words that the client said. And really, I was so shocked and appalled by that, the complete distortion of our approach that for a number of years, I said almost nothing about uh, empathic uh, listening. And when I did, it was to uh, stress an empathic attitude with very little comment as to how that attitude might be implemented in the relationship. I just became frightened of the, uh, of the distortion. I preferred to discuss the qualities of positive regard and therapist congruence, which I'd come to hypothesize as being two other uh, conditions that uh, were growth promoting in a, in a relationship. And those concepts were often misunderstood too, but uh, they never came to be caricatured in the same way that the, uh, that the empathic listening was, was caricatured. Over the years, however, the, the research evidence keeps piling up and it points strongly to the conclusion that a high degree of empathy in a relationship is possibly the most potent factor, and certainly one of the most potent factors, in bringing about change and learning. And so I believe it's time for me to forget the caricatures and misrepresentations of the past and take a fresh look at, at empathy. For still another reason, it seems timely to do this. In the United States during the past decade, Many new approaches to therapy have held center stage. Gestalt therapy, psychodrama, primal therapy, bioenergetics, rational emotive therapy, transactional analysis are some of the best known, but there are more. And part of their appeal seems to me to lie on the fact that in most instances, the therapist is clearly the expert, actively manipulating the situation, often in dramatic ways, for the client's benefit. But if I read the signs correctly, I believe that there is some decrease in the fascination with such expertise in guiding people. With another approach that is based on expertise, however, behavior therapy, I think there's no doubt that the fascination with that approach is, is on the increase. Uh, and I think I can really understand that. I think a technological society has been delighted to find a technology by which man's behavior can be shaped even without his knowledge or approval toward goals that uh, the therapist chooses or that has, have been chosen by, by society. And yet even here, much questioning by thoughtful individuals is springing up as the philosophical and the political implications of uh, such an approach become more clearly visible. So I've seen a willingness on the part of many to take another look at ways of being with people which evoke self-directed change and locate power in the person, not in the therapist. And this brings me again to examine carefully what we mean by empathy and what we've come to know about it. To formulate a current description, I would want to draw on the concept of experiencing as, as formulated by Jean Gendlin. Briefly, it's his view that 
At all times, there is going on in the human organism a flow of experiencings um, to which the individual can turn again and again as a referent in order to discover the meaning of what he is experiencing. He sees empathy as pointing sensitively to the felt meaning uh, which the client is experiencing in this particular moment. In order to help him focus on that uh, meaning and to carry it further to its full and uninhibited experiencing. An example may make more clear both the concept and its relation to empathy. A man in an encounter group is uh, making some vaguely negative statements about his father and the uh, facilitator says, it sounds like you might be angry at your father. No, don't think so. Dissatisfied with him? Mm, perhaps. Disappointed in him? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, that's it. I, I am disappointed in him. I've been disappointed in him ever since I was a child because he, he is not a strong person. I think that kind of an example, uh, well, uh, does, does illuminate Jenlin's uh, concept in this way. Against what is the man checking these various terms? Angry. No, that isn't it. Dissatisfied. Well, that's closer. Disappointed. Ah, that matches the flow of, of I think, visceral experiencing that's going on within. And a person has a very sure knowledge of, of that flow and can really tell when you're speaking to it. In other words, the right word taps the uh, the right label or the right phrase often taps the, the exact meaning of the flow that is going on within him that he hasn't been able to uh, label or, or understand himself. It enables him to bring into awareness the, the real meaning of, of what's going on within. So, um, with that conceptual background, I'd like to attempt a description of empathy that should seem satisfactory to me today. I would no longer be terming it a state of empathy, which was in my earlier definition, because I believe it to be a process rather than a state, and, and perhaps I can capture that quality. The way of being with another person, which is termed empathic, has several facets. It means entering the private perceptual world of the other and becoming thoroughly at home in it. It involves having sensitive, being sensitive moment to moment to the changing felt meanings which flow in this other person, to the fear or rage or tenderness or confusion or whatever that he or she is experiencing. It means temporarily living in his life, moving about in it delicately, without making judgments, sensing meanings of which he is scarcely aware, but not trying to uncover feelings of which he is totally unaware, since this would be too threatening. It includes communicating your sensings of his world as you look with fresh and unfrightened eyes at elements of which he is fearful. It means frequently checking with him as to the accuracy of your sensings and being guided by his responses. You are a confident companion to him in his world. By pointing to the possible meanings in the flow of his or her experiencing, you help him to focus on this useful type of referent, to experience his meanings more fully and to move forward in his or her experiencing, in his or her experiencing. Now to be with another in this way means that for the time being, you lay aside the views and values that you hold for yourself in order to enter his world without prejudice. In some sense, it means that you lay aside yourself, and this can only be done by a person who is secure enough in himself that he knows he will not get lost in what may turn out to be the strange or bizarre world of the other, and can comfortably return to his own world when he wishes. Perhaps that description makes clear that being empathic is a complex, demanding, strong, 
yet subtle and gentle way of being. I think now I'd like to move on to uh, ask the question, what have we come to know about empathy through research? The answer is that we've learned a great deal. And I'll try to present some of these learnings, giving first some of the general findings, which were of interest to me, but I'm going to reserve until uh, the latter part, the analysis of the effects of an empathic client on the recipient, because I think there's a lot to be said about the effects that it has on the, on the recipient. But here then are some of the general statements which can be made with some assurance. I'm going to put them all as though they were knowledge quotes. But we all know that research knowledge is, is limited uh, to the population which was studied, the various qualifications. All of those qualifications should be made in regard to each of the rather blunt statements that, uh, that I'm going to make. Uh, first of all, we know that the ideal therapist is first of all empathic. In a, a study of therapists to get them to uh, formulate their concept of the ideal therapist, and these were therapists from uh, I think at least eight different uh, um, orientations in therapy. Empathy was placed in the very highest rank out of out of twelve uh, possible variables. And the, the definition of empathy was similar to that used in this paper. And it, it corroborates a much earlier study by Fiedler done many years ago. So uh, we may conclude that, that the thing that most therapists are trying to do, their, their highest priority, is to be empathic. Now then, uh, another statement I'll make very briefly is that it's been learned that a high degree of empathy in a relationship is associated with various aspects of process and movement in therapy. Is it, uh, there is a clear correlation between uh, the degree of empathy in the relationship and the measures of, of process or progress uh, through therapy. Then a finding which is exciting to me and I feel hasn't been um, adequately exploited is that the degree of, of empathy which exists and which will exist in a relationship can be measured and determined very early in the game. In therapy interviews it can be determined certainly by the fifth interview. A German research says it can be determined in the second interview and that that's very closely related to the success or lack of success in the, in the total relationship. And to me that's an exciting finding because it means that uh, perhaps we could save enormous amounts of time if we determined um, by some objective measure the empathic quality of a relationship early in the game so that we would know whether it was had any high probability of success or not. If, if you find a, a highly empathic quality in a relationship, it is highly probable that the therapist is the one who, who is responsible for that. Then one finding that uh, is a little bit hopeful but also expected is that experienced therapists um, offer a higher degree of empathy than, than inexperienced, which is only to say that maybe over the years uh, therapists do come a little closer to their to being the ideal therapist they would like to be. Then a uh, quite important finding is that um, the better integrated the therapist is within himself, the higher the degree of empathy that he exhibits. Uh, personality disturbance, various kinds of adjustment problems tend to be correlated in the therapist, tend to be correlated with a lower degree of uh, empathic quality in the relationships that he, he offers. And as I've considered this evidence, and also my own experience in the training of therapists, I come to the somewhat uncomfortable conclusion that the more psychologically mature and integrated the therapist is as a person, the more helpful is the relationship he provides. 
I say that's kind of an uncomfortable conclusion because it really, uh, I don't know, throws out a challenge to all of us who are in the helping professions. If we are no better as helpers than we are as people, that's uh, which which it seems to me this is somewhat saying. Um, that's a sort of sobering thought. Then uh, another quite exciting and also sobering finding is from a study by Raskin. We describe it briefly. He got interviews from six experienced therapists. If I named their names, you would recognize all of them. I don't know if he's going to publish the names, so I'm not going to name them here. Um, from, from six different orientations. Uh, each therapist selected an interview which he regarded as characteristic and typical of his own work and submitted it for this research purpose. And Raskin picked a large segment of each of those interviews to be rated by 83 therapists of, I've forgotten, eight different uh, orientations. So that here was the therapeutic, the actual therapeutic work of six experts being rated by a large number of, of uh, mostly experienced therapists, some inexperienced, but mostly experienced therapists. And the findings are, well, yeah, two findings. One is interesting. Uh, it is that the degree of empathic quality in those relationships varies enormously. Uh, for the statistically minded, it's at a 0.001 level of significance, the, the difference in the degree of empathic quality. Um, the other finding is that he correlated <coughs> the ratings of the six expert therapists with the ideal therapist that had formerly been um, formed from the judgments of these 83 therapists. And there it is sobering. Two of these well-known therapists correlated positively with the ideal. Four correlated negatively. One at a minus 0.66. Um, now that... Uh, in the paper, I say so much for therapy as it is practiced. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It is a very sobering thing to think that uh, possibly we are that far from um, what we would like to be as therapists. The next finding then is not surprising at all. It is that therapists are quite inaccurate in assessing the quality of their own relationships. Uh, I won't go into the complicated reasoning, but there's good evidence that both clients and unbiased readers are better judges of the empathic quality of the relationship than is the therapist himself. Uh, the practical implication would be that if we want to know uh, whether we are understanding our clients, we should let them tell us. Um, But what effects do a series of deeply empathic responses have upon the recipient? Here the evidence is quite overwhelming. From schizophrenic patients to pupils in ordinary classrooms, from clients of a counseling center to teachers in training, from neurotics in Germany to neurotics in the United States, empathy is clearly related to positive outcome. There are just many studies that, that indicate that. Uh, Bergen and Strupp summarize it by saying that various studies demonstrate a positive correlation between therapist empathy, patient self-exploration, and independent criteria of patient change. Uh, so that you could say empathy and process and outcome are all positively related. But I believe that we haven't paid perhaps enough attention to that. And I want to discuss it more now from uh, perhaps a clinical point of view. I was going to say subjective, maybe maybe clinical would be a better term. What what is the effect on the on the person who is who is the recipient of a high degree of of empathic listening? 
In the first place, it dissolves alienation. For the moment, at least, the recipient finds himself a connected part of the human race. Though he may not articulate it clearly, his experience goes something like this. I've been talking about hidden things, partly veiled even from myself, feelings that are strange, possibly abnormal, feelings I've never communicated to another, not even clearly to myself. And yet he or she has understood, understood them even more clearly than I do. If he knows what I'm talking about, what I mean, then to this degree I'm not so strange or so alien or set apart. I make sense to another human being. So I am in touch with, even in relationship with others. I am no longer an isolate. Perhaps that explains one of the major findings of our study of psychotherapy with schizophrenics. We found that those patients receiving from their therapists a high degree of accurate empathy, as rated by unbiased judges, showed the sharpest reduction in schizophrenic pathology as measured by the MMPI. This suggests that sensitive understanding by another may have been the most potent element in bringing the schizophrenic out of his estrangement and into the world of relatedness. Jung has said that the schizophrenic ceases to be schizophrenic when he meets someone by whom he feels understood, and our study provides empirical evidence in support of that statement. Other studies, both of schizophrenics and of counseling center clients, show that low empathy is related to a slight worsening in adjustment or pathology. Uh, here, too, the findings make sense, I think, though it's, though it's uh, sobering sense to think that we may make people worse by, by not offering a high degree of empathy. But one of uh, Ron Lang's patients states vividly his experience uh, in contacts, earlier contacts with psychiatrists. He says it's a most terrifying feeling to realize that the doctor can't see the real you that he can't understand what you feel, and that he's just going ahead with his own ideas. Beautiful description. The patient says, I would start to feel that I was invisible, or maybe not there at all. I think that's, that's why it would have a worsening effect to feel if I'm not understood, and he's going off on his own track. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm horrible. Maybe I'm so abnormal, nobody can understand me. Another meaning of empathic understanding to the recipient is that someone values him, cares, accepts the person that he is. And it might seem here that we've stopped talking about empathy and you're talking about, about caring, but that's not quite so. It's impossible accurately to sense the perceptual world of another person unless you see that, unless you value that person and his world, unless you in some sense care. Hence, the message comes through to the recipient that this other individual values me, thinks I'm worthwhile. Perhaps I am worth something. Perhaps I could value myself. Perhaps I could care for myself. And I'd like to give a somewhat lengthy example of this from a young man who's been a recipient of much sensitive understanding and who's now in the later stages of therapy. I've used this example before, but to me it's a Jim that is worth repeating. Client says, I could even conceive of it as a possibility that I could have a kind of tender concern for me. Still, how could I be tender, be concerned for myself, when they're one and the same thing? But yet I can feel it so clearly. You know, like taking care of a child. You want to give it this and give it that? I can kind of clearly see the purposes for somebody else but I can never see them for myself, that I could do this for me, you know. Is it possible that I can really want to take care of myself and make that a major purpose of my life? That means I'd have to deal with the whole world as if I were the guardian of the most cherished and most wanted possession. That this I was between this precious me that I wanted to take care of and the whole world. It's almost as if I loved myself. You know, that's strange, but it's true. The therapist says, 
it seemed such a strange concept to realize. It would mean I would face the world as though a part of my primary responsibility was taking care of this precious individual who is me, whom I love, client goes right on, whom I care for, whom I feel so close to. Woof, that's another strange one. Therapist says, it just seems weird. Client, yeah, it hits rather close somehow. The idea of my loving me and the taking care of me. That's a very nice one. Very nice. It is, I believe, the therapist's caring understanding exhibited in this excerpt as well as previously, which has permitted this client to experience a high regard, even a love for himself. Still another impact of a sensitive understanding comes from its non-judgmental quality. The highest expression of empathy is accepting and non-judgmental. This is true because it's impossible to be accurately perceptive of another's inner world if you have formed an, evalu an evaluative opinion of him. If you doubt this statement, choose someone whom you know, with whom you deeply disagree, and who is, in your judgment, <clears throat> definitely wrong or mistaken. Now try to state his views, beliefs, feelings, so accurately that he will agree that this is a sensitively correct description of his stance. If you're like me, I think you will find that nine times out of ten you will be unable to do that if you feel judgmental toward this toward this person. Because your judgment of his views creeps into your perception and description of them. Consequently, true empathy is always free of any evaluative or diagnostic quality. This comes across to the recipient with some surprise. If I'm not being judged, perhaps I'm not so evil or abnormal as I've thought. Perhaps I don't have to judge myself so harshly. Thus gradually the possibility of self-acceptance is increased. Perhaps another way of putting some of what I've been saying is that a finely tuned understanding by another individual gives the recipient his personhood his identity. Lang has said that the, the sense of identity requires the existence of another by whom one is known. And Buber has also spoken of the need to have our existence confirmed by another. Empathy gives that needed confirmation that one does exist as a separate, valued person with an identity. I think when a person's selfhood or identity is pretty tentative or not very strong, uh, I question whether he can achieve a real identity without someone understanding him. I do regard it as quite possible when he's developed a strong selfhood, really feels confident in himself, then he might be able to affirm some new facet of himself without anyone else understanding it. At least that seems to me like a hypothetical uh, possibility. And yet, uh, for myself, I guess it comes home to me mostly with, with new ideas. Um, kind of, I can only affirm them tentatively until someone else has understood them. Then they seem to become much more possible, much more, uh, much more and I'm much more capable of affirming them then if, if, if they've proved really understandable to someone else. And I don't just mean intellectually understandable, but really understandable at some gut level. Let me turn to a more specific result of an interaction in which the individual feels understood. He finds himself revealing material he has never communicated before, and in the process he discovers a previously unknown element in himself. Such an element may be, I never knew before that I was angry at my father, or I never realized that I'm afraid of succeeding. Such discoveries are unsettling but exciting. To perceive a new aspect of oneself is the first step 
toward changing the concept of oneself. The new element is in an understanding atmosphere owned and assimilated into a now altered self-concept. This is the basis, in my estimation, of the behavior changes which come about as a result of therapy or groups and so on. Once the self-concept changes, behavior changes to match the freshly perceived self. Then, if we think, however, that empathy is effective only in the one-to-one -one relationship that we call psychotherapy, we are greatly mistaken. Even in the classroom, it makes an important difference. When the teacher shows evidence that he or she understands the meaning of classroom experiences for the student, learning improves. In a study made by Aspie, it was found that children's reading improved significantly more when teachers exhibited a high degree of understanding than in classrooms where such understanding did not exist. To me, that's not surprising just as the client in psychotherapy finds that empathy provides a climate for learning more of himself, so the student in the classroom finds himself in a climate for learning subject matter when he is in the presence of an understanding teacher. And just recently, after I'd written this, uh, I received a new manuscript by Aspie, which summarizes almost a dozen years of work, now covers several countries, thousands of pupils and teachers, uh, in many, many classrooms. And what I've said here is more than borne out by the much further extended research. So I had some copies of that, with his permission, run off, and you'll find those uh, in the office. And those of you in education, I think, would be quite interested Again, not necessarily surprised, it's what we would like to believe, it's what we think when we, when we try to be human in the classroom. But it's the kind of evidence that you can show to your board of trustees or to your principal or whatnot. It is uh, evidence that being human, being understanding, really pays in, in, the, in the classroom in, in many other ways than just uh, learning subject matter, too. Thus far, I have spoken of the more obvious change-producing effects of empathy. I should like to turn to an aspect having to do with the dynamics of personality. I'll make several brief statements and then endeavor to explain their meaning and, and significance. I'll make several brief statements and then endeavor to explain their meaning and, and significance. When a person is perceptively understood, he finds himself coming in touch with a wider range of, of his experiencing. This gives him an expanded referent to which he can turn for guidance in understanding himself and in directing his behavior. If the empathy has been accurate and deep, he may also be able to unblock a flow of experiencing and permit it to run its uninhibited course. Well, you may well want to ask me, what, what do I mean by those statements? I believe they'll be clearer if I present an excerpt from a recorded interview with a woman in the later stages of therapy. This, is, this too is an excerpt I've used before, but it's particularly appropriate here. A middle-aged woman is exploring some of the complex feelings that have been troubling her. She says, I have the feeling it isn't guilt. She begins to weep. Of course, I mean, I can't verbalize it yet. It's just being terribly hurt. And the therapist says, it isn't guilt except in the sense of being very much wounded somehow. She continues weeping. It's, you know, often I've been guilty of it myself, but in later years, when I've heard parents say to their children, stop crying, I've had a feeling, a hurt, as though, well, why should they tell them to stop crying? They feel sorry for themselves. And who can feel more adequately sorry for it? himself than the child. Well, that's sort of what I mean, as though I mean, I thought that they should let him cry, and feel sorry for him too, maybe, in a rather objective kind of way. But, well, that's, that's something of the kind of thing I've been experiencing. I mean now, just right now. The therapist says, that catches a little more of the flavor of the feeling, that it's almost as if you're really weeping for yourself. Yeah, 
And again, you see, there's conflict. Our culture is such that, well, I mean, one doesn't indulge in self-pity. But this isn't, I mean, I feel it doesn't quite have that connotation. May have. The therapist says, you sort of think there's a cultural objection to feeling sorry about yourself. And yet you feel the feeling you're experiencing isn't quite what the culture objects to either. And then, of course, I've come to see and to feel that over this, see, I've covered it up, and she bursts into tears, that I've covered it up with so much bitterness, which in turn I had to cover up. That's what I want to get rid of. I almost don't care if I hurt. The therapist, you feel it here at the basis of it as you experience it is a feeling of real tears for yourself. But that you can't show, you mustn't show. So that's been covered by bitterness that you don't like, that you'd like to be rid of. You almost feel you'd rather absorb the hurt than to feel the bitterness. And what you seem to be saying quite strongly is, I do hurt and I've tried to cover it up. The client says, I didn't know it. The therapist says, like a new discovery, really. The client says, I never really did know. But it's, you know, it's almost a physical thing. It's a sort of, as though I were looking within myself at all kinds of nerve endings and bits of things that have been sort of mashed. The therapist says, as though some of the most delicate aspects of you, physically almost, have been crushed or hurt. She says, yes. And you know, I do get the feeling, oh, you poor thing. But here I think it's clear that empathic therapist responses encourage her in the wider exploration of and closer acquaintance with the visceral experiencing that's going on within. She's learning to, to listen to her guts, to use that inelegant term. She has expanded her knowledge of the flow of experiencing within herself. And here, too, we see again how this unverbalized visceral flow is used as a referent. How does she know that guilt is not the word to describe her feeling? By turning within, taking another look at this reality, this palpable process which is taking place, this experiencing. I think in the example I was giving that uh, it's pretty clear that when a person is perceptively understood and he comes, in this case she, comes in touch with a wider range of her experiencing, is able to use that more as an expanded referent and is able, and this is I think a concept that's a little difficult to catch, is able to let a blocked experiencing carry itself through to its to its real conclusion. And now I'm coming to the conclusions that I want to make in regard to the paper. Really sort of two concluding sections. Uh, I want now to back off and give a rather different perspective on the significance of empathy. We can say that when a person finds himself sensitively and accurately understood, he develops a set of growth-promoting or therapeutic attitudes toward himself. Let me explain what I mean. First of all, the, the non-evaluative and acceptant quality of the empathic climate enables him, as we've seen, to take a prizing, caring, even loving attitude toward himself. And second, being listened to by an understanding person makes it possible for him to listen more accurately to himself with greater empathy toward his own visceral experiencing his own vaguely felt meanings. But his greater understanding and praising of himself opens up to him new facets of his experience which become a part of a more accurately based self. His self is now more congruent with his experiencing. Thus he has become, in his attitudes toward himself, more caring and acceptant more empathic and understanding, more real and congruent. 
But these three elements are the very ones which both experience and research indicate are the attitudes of an effective therapist. So we are perhaps not overstating the total picture if we say that an empathic understanding by another has enabled the person to become a more effective growth enhancer, a more effective therapist for himself. Consequently, whether we are functioning as therapists, as encounter group facilitators, as teachers, or as parents, we have in our hands, if we're able to take an empathic stance, a powerful force for change and growth. I think its strength needs to be appreciated. And then finally, I want to put all that I've said into a larger context, because I've been speaking only of the empathic process, it may seem that I regard it as the only important factor in growthful relationships. I would not wish to leave that impression. I'd like briefly to state my views as to the significance of what I see as the three attitudinal elements making for growth in their relationship to one another. In the ordinary interactions of life between sex partners, between teacher and student, employer and employee, or between colleagues, it's probable that congruence is the most important element. Such genuineness involves letting the other person know where you are emotionally. It may involve confrontation and the owned and straightforward expression of both positive and negative feelings. Thus, congruence is a basis for living together in a climate of realness. But in certain other special situations, caring or prizing may turn out to be the most significant. Such situations include nonverbal relationships, parent and infant, therapist and mute psychotic, and the like. Caring is an also an attitude which is known to foster creativity a nurturing climate in which delicate and tentative new thoughts and productive processes can emerge. And then, in my experience, there are other situations in which the empathic way of being has the highest priority. When the other person is hurting, confused, troubled, anxious, alienated, terrified, when he's doubtful of his own self-worth, uncertain as to his identity, the gentle and sensitive companionship of an empathic stance, accompanied, of course, by the other two attitudinal elements, provides illumination and healing. In such situations, it is, I believe, the most precious gift that one can give to another.